Thank you very much, Graham, and thank you to members of the Society for inviting me here tonight. I actually, I'm really glad that it's on Zoom because um, the weather outside is terrible, at least it is here in Falkirk, where I'm based. So um, this is one of the advantages of Zoom, I suppose. You don't actually have to go out and, and get wet. So my title then, Raising the Dead, Constructing Characters from the Ancient Christian Past. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair has written of his fascination for Pontius Pilate and the agonizing choice he was faced with as governor of Judea. The intriguing thing about Pilate, Blair claimed, is the degree to which he tried rather than the bad. He commands our moral attention, not because he was a bad man, but it, because he was so a good man. One can imagine him agonizing, seeing that Jesus had done nothing wrong and wishing to release him. Just as easily, however, one can envisage Pilate's advisors telling him of the risks, warning him not to cause a riot or inflame Jewish opinion. It's possible to see Pilate as the archetypal politician, caught on the horns of an age old political dilemma. Should we do what appears principled or what is politically expedient? Tony Blair wrote this in 1996. After his invasion of Iraq, his words take on heightened relevance. As a politician, Blair instinctively identified with Pilate, understanding the unbearable decision he was called on to make. The pull between head and heart, principles or pragmatism, and the terrible consequences of making the wrong choice. Despite the two millennia that separated them, and his dilemma could still strike a chord. A few years ago, I went to Israel with Sinn Féin leader Jerry Adams to make a documentary about Jesus for Channel 4. We spent a lot of time talking about characters in the Gospels, but what sticks in my memory most about that trip was Mr. Adams's interpretation of Judas Iscariot. I'd been merrily making my way through the various scholarly attempts to explain Judas's betrayal of his master. Did he do it for the money? Was it simply a case of greed? Was he disillusioned in some way? Had he hoped Jesus would pursue a more nationalistic agenda, perhaps taking up arms against the Roman overlords? Had he even been in league with Jesus? Was his betrayal agreed between the two of them, a plot to get us somehow to stand in front of the chief priests? But Jerry wasn't really listening. They got to him, he said. The chief priests, they had some power over him and made him do their bidding. The more I thought about it, the more I realized he had a point. Scholars commonly suggest that Judas may have been the only disciple of the Twelve from Judea in the south. All the others seem to be northerners from Galilee. And maybe that made him or his family more vulnerable to chief priestly pressure or even intimidation. Maybe the temple aristocracy felt they could threaten him more easily than the others. What seemed to be an intractable change of allegiance to biblical scholars seemed readily understandable and even likely to someone with Mr. Adams' background. Once again, as with Tony Blair, the biblical character resonated with Jerry Adams' life experience and spoke directly to him. Pilate and Judas. But the Gospels are full of many other vivid and memorable characters. We might also add King Herod ordering the death of the Bethlehem toddlers, Herod Antipas's dancing daughter, John the Baptist dressed in camps, blind Bartimaeus calling to Jesus as he sits on his grubby cloak. The woman who creeps up to Jesus, hoping his touch will cure her hemorrhage, the sower and his seed, or the woman who anoints Jesus's head with an incredibly expensive jar of oil. 
those of us who grew up in a Christian tradition will have heard these stories since our childhood, encountering men in Western art and culture. Even when these characters are cut adrift from their biblical context, they still have a habit of appearing time and again in literature and films. The trope of the prodigal son who squanders his inheritance before returning who risks everything for the greatest treasure, or the protagonist who sacrifices her own for those of others. Whether we recognize them or not, these tropes are all part of our biblical heritage. And the characters are so in great surprise on the rare occasion when a biblical character accounts to find a divergent, even contradictory picture. Take Pilate again, an unremarkable provincial governor, a Roman knight in charge of a third-rate backwater province, writers. The trait that they offer is strikingly different to the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, after Pilate left Judea in 37 CE, takes a dim view of the Roman governor, accusing him of insensitivity towards the people's religious feelings, designs on the temple money, and a fondness for putting down uprisings with too firm a hand. But it's Pilate's contemporary, Philo of Alexandria, whose description should give us most pause for thought. Philo tells of an incident where Pilate gold and shields in the Jerusalem Praetorium in honor of the emperor. The Jewish people, however, complained about the, sh the shields, presumably because they contained the full name of the emperor, including his status as son of God, an accolade that was problematic in the city. The Jewish leaders threatened to send an embassy to Augustus, at which point Philo contains the following aid, that if they really sent an embassy, they would bring accusations against the rest of his administration as well, specifying in detail his venality, his violence, his threat, his thefts, his assaults, his abusive behavior, his frequent executions of untried prisoners and his endless savage ferocity. So as he was a spiteful and angry person, he was in a serious dilemma for he had neither the courage to re remove what he had once set up, nor the desire to do anything which would please his subjects. More of a character assassination, perhaps, than a straightforward depiction. Of course, it would be a mistake to take either of these Jewish accounts entirely at face value. Neither had any particular reason to like their Roman overlords. And both need to be understood in the broader context of their author's rhetorical aims. Josephus wanted to show that the Rome, to some extent, was due to incompetent Roman governors like Jews, by contrasting Pilate's wickedness, shape and mould the facts in support of their arguments. But even so, the contrast between what Philo says of Pilate in the passage on the slide and the indecisive wavering governor of the Gospels is quite striking. Of course, real human beings are complex and contradictory. It would be perfectly possible for Philo's monster to have had a trial that brought him up short. We might even speculate as to whether Pilate's reported brutality was, to some degree, an attempt to hide wickedness and indecisiveness. But somehow this doesn't quite seem to bridge the gap. To adapt a line from Pilate himself, 
where is truth in all of this? Who is closest to the real historical pilot? The Gospels or Philo? Is it possible to find an answer at a distance of 2000 years? And perhaps more importantly, does it even matter? Is a well-crafted story in the end better than an accurate one? When it comes to female characters, the problems are even more profound. Not only are women far less likely to turn up in the historical records, but now we have the added problem of a history of male interpretation that insists on dividing women into virgins or whores. Take Mary Magdalene, for example. The Gospels tell us surprisingly little about Mary, far much, much less than you might imagine. St Mark introduces her only at the end, where she stands at the cross alongside a group of other women who have followed Jesus from Galilee. She sees where Jesus is buried and comes back to the same place on the Sunday morning, thus becoming an important witness to the empty tomb. And this is her chief, perhaps only role in Mark's gospel. And she's only there really because all of the men have run away by this stage. It's Luke who says Jesus exorcised seven demons from her and John, who describes her vision of the resurrected Jesus early on the Sunday morning, where she mistakes him for the gardener. But that's all there is. There is nothing here to suggest that she's anything other than a thoroughly respectable female follower of Jesus. It was only much, much later in the sixth century that male interpreter, interpreters amalgamated a range of gospel women into Mary. Part of the difficulty here is that, as you may have noticed, almost half of the women in the gospel story are called Mary, which just sort of encourages people to mix them up. So we have the woman who anoints Jesus with precious perfume, who is also called Mary in John's gospel, and the unnamed sinful woman from the, the city in Luke. And all of these women are melded together to create the composite Magdalene who featured so heavily in the preaching of Pope Gregory the Great, who was the first one really to promote the idea of Mary Magdalene as a prostitute. What else could a sinful woman be prostitute? And how else to explain the seven demons except as became the great example of penitence and conversion in the earlier medieval church, a representation of the restraint of womanly lust and a symbol of Jesus's forgiveness and compassion. She's one of the most painted biblical figures in medieval art, patron saint of women, reformed prostitutes, apothecaries and hairdressers. And her afterlife continues the edition of the Gnostic Gospels, where she's now said to be Jesus's companion. Until she reaches her starring role in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, now cast as Jesus's wife. If the penitent Magdalene spoke to the medieval church, it's the Magdalene as Jesus's other half that captures popular imagination today. In an age where chastity seems unnatural and when people are only too ready to believe in ecclesiastical cover-ups and conspiracy theories, Mary, the overlooked and disparaged wife of Jesus, takes on a new appeal and resonates with a different audience. In actual fact, Modern scholars suspect that much of Mary's historical importance lay in a rather different direction. The fact that the Gospels mention any female disciples at all is significant. And the fact that all the Gospels mention Mary Magdalene, even when they differ quite a, a lot as to the, the names of other women, is surely noteworthy. These tiny echoes are probably part of a much fuller story of Mary Magdalene 
as the leader of a mission to women. In effect, a counterpart to Peter. In a patriarchal age, when male missionaries would have found it difficult, if not impossible, to meet with a woman and speak to her unchaperoned, a parallel woman's mission would have been vital. Mary and other female missionaries would have been able to go homes to talk to them as they wash their clothes in the river and share stories as they fetch water. They would be able to baptize women, touching them, anointing them with oil and healing them in exactly the same way as the men are said to have done. The prevalence of missionary couples in the early church, such as Prisca and Aquila, who are known to us both from the Book of Acts and also Paul's letters, lends force to this suggestion. By acting as pairs, women and men together could spread the word much more and forcefully than male missionaries alone. The fact that people don't seem to have picked up on this significance until quite recently, I think, speaks volumes for the androcentric way in which early Christianity has generally been reconstructed. But what of Jesus, the most significant gospel character? If the problem with female followers is that we have so little information, that we have to fill in the gaps ourselves, the opposite is true when it comes to Jesus. Now we have to be too much information, too many stories of his activities and accounts of his teaching. The Apostle Paul famously has little to say about Jesus, other than the fact that he was crucified and a handful of other small notes. But this is more than made up for canonical gospels and a mass of other later ones generally known as apocryphal or non-canonical gospels. All of these, we see Jesus as a prophetic teacher, one who teaches with great authority and who has miraculous powers, someone who's generally regarded by his supporters as being anointed by God to teach the coming of, the, of God's kingdom. Someone too, who ultimately fell foul of both the Jewish and Roman authorities of his day, and who ended up on a Roman cross. Given Jesus's lowly provincial status, it's hardly surprising that virtually everything we know about him comes from supporters, second and third generation Christians, who took it upon themselves to tell the story they inherited. Romans, at least the elite Romans who tended to leave written records, only really became interested in Jesus when the movement he founded started to become a nuisance. In the early second century, Tacitus and Pliny the Younger mention him briefly in the context of localized Christian persecutions. Somewhat earlier though, the Jewish historian Josephus included a whole paragraph on Jesus. Though modern scholars are convinced that what we now have has been edited by Christian copyists. The underlined phrases on the slide here were doubtless inserted by copyists whose piety wouldn't allow them to write out the passage without making their views known. Probably they wrote their pious assertions in the margins of the text from where in time they became absorbed into the main book. So if we have a look at what Josephus says, around this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed it's right to call him a man, for he was a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who accept the truth with pleasure. He won over both many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Messiah. Pilate, when he heard him accused by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross. But those who had first loved him did not cease. For on the third day he appeared to them alive again, because the divine prophets had prophesied these and myriad other things about him. To this day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not disappeared. 
Josephus was a Pharisaic Jew to his dying day and couldn't possibly have written the account as it now stands. But the paragraph appears as part of a series of tumults that broke out in Judea at about the same time. As nothing now is it seems highly likely to me that an original account of some kind of a tumult has been quietly dropped. Perhaps Josephus's version of the incident in the temple where Jesus overturned the tables of the moneylenders. The only thing that we know of from the gospel record that could conceivably be considered as a tumult. Needless to say, perhaps I would give an awful lot of money to have a copy of the actual version that Josephus wrote, to have an account of Jesus, of Jesus from um, a, a Jewish near contemporary would be priceless. But as it stands in its bare bones, what we have here generally supports the gospel picture. Over the past decades, there's been a whole industry devoted to reconstructing the historical Jesus. In the interests of full disclosure, I should admit that it's something I've been involved with too, as Graham has already said. I've now written two books on the historical Jesus, though the second, the one that Graham held up, was significantly shorter than the first. This was partly to do with publishers' word limits. The second was designed to be a very brief history. But it also had to do with my own sense of unease with the whole enterprise. When it comes to uncovering the historical Jesus, the scholarly method is largely to compare events in the four gospels and to decide which seems most likely to be historical. Given that Mark's gospel is generally thought to be the earliest, probably from the early 70s CE, and that Mark is the source for Matthew, Luke, and quite probably John, this means that in practice, the portrait of the historical Jesus that scholars come up with tends to be very much like the Jesus of Mark. The question then becomes, how reliable is Mark? And how far was he actually interested in factual reporting? In the early 20th century, biblical scholars got very excited by comparative work on oral traditions. Looking at epic and Nordic sagas, they imagined that stories about Jesus floated about the early church, quickly taking shape as fixed units. Various Christian missionaries, they argued, had their own stock of such oral units and passed them on in their teaching. And at some point, the evangelists wrote these oral units down, inserting them into their accounts like beads on a string. Those responsible for the Gospels were considered not to be literary men at all, but writers and editors their own work limited to only the linking sentences and the arrangements of the units. According to this view, the Gospels, in effect, give us access to oral tradition as it existed in the church around the time that the Gospels were written in the late first century CE. I'm caricaturing a little, of course, though not as much as you might hope. This view of gospel origins was hugely popular in the interwar years and has proved remarkably resilient. It's still held in various modified forms by many scholars today. And if you hold the view that the gospels are essentially collections of older oral material, then traditional historical Jesus work makes sense. It's natural to compare units to work out which is the older form and to try to peel back layers and accretions so that you expose the very earliest version. My problem with all of this and the reason why my books on Jesus keep getting shorter is that I no longer believe that that's how the Gospels came into being. There are three things I want to consider very briefly here. 
oral tradition, memory, and the Gospels as literary artifacts. So first then, oral tradition. Recent work on oral tradition has exposed its fluidity rather than its fixed nature. The advantage of oral storytelling is that every occasion can be different, precise needs of an audience and their situation. Writing oral stories down freezes them in time and they quickly begin to lose their relevance, forever reaching out to a situation that has long since passed. Closely connected with this are modern studies of memory. On an individual level, memory is hardly the to recall that many of us tend to think. Quite the opposite. Anyone who has ever sat down with another person and tried to recall the details of will realize that memory is fragile, prone to distortion and unstable. We easily forget who was there or when an event took place. We have a tendency to roll two or more events together into the same one and are highly influenced by other people's accounts. We're much better at remembering the gist of what happened rather than the thousands of inconsequential details make up real life. We see everything through our own individual perspective. Far from being a mental video that we can play back, memory is patchy, biased and hazy. Moreover, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the present on our recollection of the past. It's not that the past has no meaning to us, it clearly does, but we only remember things because they are of use or significance to us in the present. And past memories are quite unconsciously updated so that they retain their relevance or else they're simply forgotten. Collective memory, as the shared story has have more to do with shared values and building a sense of community and identity in the present than with establishing the factuality of past events. Great biblical themes such as the exodus from Egypt tap into a powerful sense of group identity and a shared past, irrespective of whether the book of Exodus could be shown to be factually accurate or not. Think about the story of the zealots last stand on Masada, killing themselves rather than surrendering to the Olympians. Modern scholars are highly skeptical as to whether this actually took place, even whether there were any zealots at all on Masada. But the myth is still a powerful one in Israeli culture. Similarly, allegiance to the idea of a new covenant made by the God of Israel through the death and resurrection was the cultural memory that bound the earliest Christians, irrespective of the details of the story. The evangelists, of course, shared this overarching cultural memory of other stories, many perhaps originating as real life memories but suffering from the vagaries of recall as they were told and retold to ever-changing audiences. And third, Cades, it's become increasingly clear to scholars that contrary to the older view that I outlined earlier, the Gospels are indeed literary and logical products. Each gospel has its own distinctive view of Jesus and the meaning of his mission. And each displays a different set of themes, motifs and premises. Even when they are working with a source, each one rewrites it in his own way. A material is selected and shaped throughout in accordance with each evangelist's literary, theological and pastoral purposes. In effect, each gospel is a reception of the Jesus story, as its author takes 
from the swirling diversity of tradition and creates his own new path through it. Each reception is intimately connected. Each retelling of the story is at the same time an interpretation, a new way of thinking about it in a new situation. And all of this means that taking a gospel text, peeling back the layers to reveal a measure of authentic material is doomed to failure. In the end, all we have are the texts and the historical situation that they illumine most clearly is that of their late first century audience with their unique set of circumstances, anxieties and hopes. The current scholarly consensus is that the Gospels are ancient biographies. And my own work has recently um, focused on thinking about the implications of this. What difference does it make to say that the Gospels are biographies rather than any other kind of literature? The Gospels stand as part of a long tradition of Greek lives of philosophers stretching all the way back to Socrates. While Romans preferred to write about the daring deeds of state and kings, Greeks wrote about thinkers or teachers. All, however, were particularly concerned with virtue or sometimes vice. Rather like Victorian biographies, ancient ones held up a hero's virtues and life to public scrutiny and encourage the audience to imitate them. Pre-Freud, there was very little attention to person only occasionally as a vice to be avoided. Biographies of philosophers or teachers allowed new audiences to get close to them, to hear them again and to become disciples. In effect, raising them from the dead so that they could influence a new generation of followers. Central to biography was the idea of the soul of his hero. Constructing a life from words alone is not an easy thing. The of fictionalization was allowed, even necessary. A biographer often needed to add extra details, to make up inner thoughts, even to alter the sequence of events more fully to bring out the hero's character. And this, of course, is not just confined to ancient biography. Most modern biographers who reflect on their craft suggest similar things. Biography differs from history in that it isn't always the big events that best show character. It's not always the battles won or the speeches made that show you what a person is really like. But the little things, the small exchanges, the way people treat their children or slaves, the way they dress, their attitude to money, these are things that give insight into what they're really like. And that brings me back to stories. The building blocks of biography are stories or anecdotes, a little scene or vignette that perfectly illustrates someone's character. The Greek word for them is a well-known literary unit which forms the heart of the Greek and Roman education system. Young boys and occasionally girls were set um, passages which they were supposed to rewrite as little crea, little anecdotes. And the tiny paragraphs in the Gospels are not then units of formally floating oral tradition, but carefully crafted anecdotes, stories that bring home their message. Like other biographies, the Gospels string them together but each can be read and pondered on its own merit. Each one creates its own little world with its own central 
for actors and events. And each provides a momentary insight into the central actor's character, for good or ill. I've been thinking about anecdotes a great deal lately. Two close colleagues sadly passed away recently, and it fell to me to write obituaries. Like biography, obituary relies to a great extent on the anecdote. We love recalling the time when Professor so-and-so missed the train to Glasgow and what he said to the station manager, or when the college dean got lost on Buchanan Street and had to be helped out of phrases. Well-known characters attract anecdotes. Winston Churchill, of course, is famous for the amount of anecdotes and pithy sayings that, that are connected to him, whether accurately or not. But what struck me particularly as I was writing these obituaries was the fact that some of the most memorable anecdotes in each case were very unlikely to have actually happened, or if they did happen, they'd been seriously enlarged in the telling. And yet, at a very deep level, they conveyed an untruthful sense of the colleague's character. Apocryphal stories, we might call them. But should an obituary writer refrain from including stories that she suspects are apocryphal or judge them by different standards of truth? It seems to me that gospel writers were in a similar position. Many of the stories that they inherited and reshaped to fit their biographies probably had some link at some level with factual events. But much more important was the desire to expose Jesus's character and way of life, to uncover his soul. Some stories are relatively unproblematic. Jesus's disputes with opponents, for example, his welcome to children and inclusive teaching, all told to present Jesus in a positive light as a kind and gracious teacher, always able to get the better of opponents and an example for the audience to follow. But others might strike us today as more problematic. Stories of Jesus stilling the storm or walking on the water, for example, may or may not have happened. But the point is that they show Jesus as one who possesses the power of God over nature. They tell us who these early followers deeply believed Jesus to be, rather than necessarily offering a factual account of what he did. And of course, nobody before the 18th century had our modern day assumption that if something didn't actually happen, it wasn't true. Ancient people were quite well aware of the distinction between fact and fiction, whether something happened or whether it didn't. Where they differ from us is in supposing that the proper vehicles for truth were myth, poetry, and above all, story. So we perhaps shouldn't be too surprised if characters in the gospel in the history. The anecdotes crafted by the evangelists present us with timeless, deeply held ideas, hopes and anxieties. With their all too human struggles, it will continue to fascinate audiences always with surroundings and still having something vital to say. Whatever their historical counterparts, these literary characters are continually raised again and set free as people encounter them again and again in the gospel stories and beyond. Thank you. We predicted the first question between ourselves correctly. No surprise. Um, the uh, 
and that is what evidence is there that Pontius Pilate was born in Fort in Gaul in Perthshire? <laughs> um, oh, uh, lots. <laughs> No, uh, very, very little. And um, I mean, the Romans weren't really kind of up here quite as early as uh, Pilate needed to be born. As far as I understand it, there's a, there was a stone with PP on it, and that seems to have been enough. But I, what what's really interesting about these traditions, I think, is that um, it's not only Fortingal that's associated with Pilate. So um, there's traditions that he's from um, Germany and from Spain. There's even um, a, a lake in, um, in Switzerland um, a, a, next to a mountain, which is called Mount Pilatus. And supposedly Pilate's, um, Pilate's bones, uh, Pilate's body was, was, was put in the lake. Um, so I, I always find it really interesting to sort of speculate on, on why why people sort of wanted to associate with Pilate. Was it them who said they themselves who said, you know, Pilate came from from our place or was it opponents who said you guys are so bad? Um, Pontius Pilate was one of you. And there's also different traditions about Pilate in, in the in the Western parts of the um, Roman Empire. He was seen as as a bad and in the Eastern part he was he was even made into a saint in the Ethiopic church so um, even opinion on Pilate was actually quite diverse in the early church but um, so Pilate actually has has a very lively afterlife um, popping up in all sorts of places not least Fortingal. Yes so he probably couldn't have played rugby for Scotland in that case. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no. There's a question here about the um, I think um, two go together. One is how much has the nuance of language with translation through several languages affected the Bible stories we have today? Because you gave the example of Josephus and how you could see how translation had inserted things. And I, I the question is asking whether there's more of that type of changing as the, as the story goes through different languages. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's always a really interesting question. Um, I, I see it was something like Josephus because our earliest versions of Josephus come from the 11th century. Um, so they're actually really, really late. You know, there, there, there's over a thousand years of this text being copied and, and transmitted um, that, that we just don't have access to. In the case of the Gospels, we've actually got some very early texts. We've got um, papyrus from uh, second, third century. So, so we can go back quite early with the Gospels, and they're all obviously written in Greek, um, but there are all sorts of variant forms in these, um, in these early texts. Um, and and, and there, are, there are places where it's not certain what, what the, the, the real text actually, um, actually says. And, and what I mention with Josephus actually happens quite often too, that um, as Christians are, are copying these texts out in sort of scriptoriums in monasteries, um, quite often people put little comments in the margin um, and then gradually these, these marginal comments get, um, get put into the text itself. So there are, sometimes you'll see in Bibles bits that are sort of in brackets and, and that's perhaps because not all versions have that. So, so certainly it's the process of transmission, I think, is, is a difficult one. And we are talking 2000 years, you know, it's a long time to be transmitting texts, most of the time just done by hand um, by scribes and scholars. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the whole thing about translation into English. I mean, there's so many different translations and um, variations. And, and I suppose people choose whatever, whatever one they most like, you know, whatever style they like there. But, um, but again, you know, I think modern translations are trying to kind of get a modern um, way of reading the text. And, and the more modern and accessible the text is, then again, I think the more we can sort of resonate with these characters. Yeah. There's a question here about whether, as part of the oral tradition, was there any musical ballad tradition which complements the written record? Oh, that's an amazing question. Um, why not? I mean, I, I would imagine so. I mean, you know, people are singing, people are singing hymns at, at past over and um, for a lot of you know I showed that rather romantic picture of sort of a campfire and people sitting around it sharing stories 
um, I'm sure there would have been singing um, and early Christians as Jews would have would have sung the Psalms, um, but they might well have sung their own, um, their own hymns, their own stories. There's quite a few bits and pieces in Paul's um, letters that are thought to be perhaps part of a sort of an early hymn or some kind of um, poetic um, thing like that. But I mean, we just don't have any, any insight into that. I mean, we do know that the early Christians sung hymns, but we don't really know very much about the content of those hymns. Is there any evidence that the Gospels were incorporating uh, older stories which predate the Christ story? Oh, um, there, there are people who, who have found sort of, I mean, references to Romulus or um, Socrates and, and uh, things like that in, um, in some of the Gospels. I mean, Luke's Gospel gives Jesus a much more sort of noble death. Um, than than Marx, so so I think there is some sort of pilfering from from other stories, and of course, I mean that the whole sort of vast repertoire of Jewish stories. Um, there's lots of uh, nods here and there in the Gospels to the stories of um, Moses and Abraham and, and and the Exodus, and these are all sort of motifs that keep coming into the Jesus story. I mean, for example, when Jesus. Um, feeds the 5,000, there's real, really, really clear um, links there with uh, Moses and the manna in the wilderness. Um, there's also links with Elisha, who, who um, fed 20 soldiers um, and still had, had um, stuff left over at the end. Um, there's, there's links there with the Eucharist, too. You can see all these different kind of um, uh, things that have kind of come into the story there. So, so, so the, the, the writers are, are working in this whole sort of contextual framework where they're bringing them all in and they're sort of swirling them all around and, and, and um, nodding to various traditions as they go. You, you mentioned Luke and there's a question here. How did Luke find out about Jesus? Did he use an oral tradition and people's memories before arranging things into his story? <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, yeah, I mean, his it, Luke is really interesting because he gives us a prologue. I mean, it's not a very long prologue. It's not as long as most of his Roman contemporaries who would have given a very long introduction to their work and told us all about why they were the best person to be writing this work. Um, but he does say, <coughs> he says that lots of other people have tried writing accounts. Um, which probably refers to at least Mark's gospel because he you know, he seems to use Mark as the basis for his own account. Um, and it does seem to suggest that he knows of other accounts, perhaps other written accounts. Um, probably he's got other oral stories. Um, I mean, people at the time would have, I think, tried to, to seek out people who'd perhaps known Jesus or known people who'd known Jesus. And um, I think he would probably have been quite diligent about trying to find out information. But that's not necessarily because he wants to be um, historical and factual, although perhaps he does to some extent. But all of these stories, I think there's there's a lot of um, you know, writing them up in, in the manner that, that suits what Luke wants to say. And, and Luke is very keen on this idea of Jesus as the um, as the person going to the oppressed and the marginalised. And, and that's sort of the big theme that that he keeps um, going back to throughout his gospel. Yes, you, you've uh, I think <coughs> I, I, I anticipated a, a question about Luke as, as, a, as a forensic investigator before he put pen to, to paper. Um, but there's another question here about, um, are we, from Tony Burton, are we able through archaeological research to find anything more about the stories in the Old Testament? And, and can I add a rider to that? Because when you go to you know, what's called the Holy Land, that you're surrounded by places that are very familiar in terms of what's supposed to have happened there. At the same time, you're aware that, that you know, the Church of the Nativity and the Holy Sepulchre are probably not where <coughs> the birth and the crucifixion took place. In your travels, have you come to places where you think, gosh, this is really where something did happen? <laughs> I think it's really difficult. And, and, and obviously the whole tourist industry is based on um, showing you the very places where these things happened. Um, 
I, I, the, the difficulty, especially in places like Jerusalem, is that it was more or less flattened twice, um, once by the Romans in, in 70 AD and then again in 135 by Hadrian. It was completely flattened then. Uh, they drove a massive big road through it and excluded Jews from the city. So I think a lot of those memories would have been lost. <coughs> um, I mean, it, it's it's possible that some of the places um, remain, and, and, and certainly, I mean, you know, we can we can look at the site of Herod's palace. We can look at um, the place where Pontius Pilate stayed out on the coast in Caesarea. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a sore throat today. Um, so we can sort of identify some of these places linked with some of the major characters. But I think it's very difficult to um, to say anything about about people like Jesus who really didn't leave much record um, in the in the archaeological um, uh, record. Yeah. Is there anything in the contemporary uh, Roman literature? I mean, you mentioned Tacitus, but are there other things that uh, sort of cross tabulate with what the Gospels are saying? I think you've gone mute, Helen. Helen, I think you're mute. Ah, that's right. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I was getting a sig signal that said you, you are not able to unmute yourself. Oh. Yeah. You get, it was a question about whether there were contemporary texts from the Romans in addition to Tacitus that provide support for what the Gospels are saying. No, no. And, and this is what leads to, um, you know, things on the Internet about Jesus being a myth and Jesus never existed. And <coughs> apparently there was a, um, a, a survey you know, and um, a huge proportion of people under 30, I think it's something like 40 percent of people under 30 were of the opinion that Jesus didn't exist. So, I mean, it's absolutely quite amazing. And one of the reasons I think why this gains some traction is um, because there isn't much um, Jesus from uh, Roman authors. Um, and I think, as, as I tried to say in, in the talk, I think the reason for that is that elite Romans just aren't interested in somebody of Jesus's low status. They only become interested in Jesus when his followers start to become a problem. So, so yeah. <coughs> Tacitus talks about the followers of Jesus in the time of Nero and Nero of course had set fire to, to uh, Rome and wanted scapegoats so he blamed the, the, the Christians and at that stage clearly Christians were becoming um, a group of people that could be identified and Tacitus says that they were generally hated by the population. So, um, so Tacitus starts to take note of them at this point, um, because they have now sort of impacted on um, Roman history. Yeah. But otherwise, I think um, Romans aren't particularly interested in, um, in Christians. So <coughs> there's a little bit in Pliny the Younger. Um, he's writing to the Emperor Trajan and he says, I'm, I keep coming across these Christians. I don't know what to do with them. Um, I've, I've, I've sort of um, had a chat with them and I, I, I tell them to, to curse Jesus. And if they curse Jesus, then that's fine. But um, otherwise I kill them. And Trajan writes back and says, yes, that's probably the best thing to do. Um, so again, um, Pliny is, is becoming interested in them once they're a problem in his province, but otherwise he's, he's not interested in getting to the bottom of what Christianity is about. You know, they're not interested in kind of the history of of Christian origins at all. No. And and are there, uh, how do the do the uh, the ancient texts of other religions compare in terms of historical accuracy? <laughs> um, I suppose. I mean, I suppose what's different about Christi Christianity, fundamentally different about Christianity than other religions, is that Christianity is linked to this. Um, historical event you know the incarnation the idea that God became a person in one specific and that means that Christianity is always going to be to some extent a historical religion and there's always going to be 
historical questions, I think, just aren't. Um, I mean, I, the one I know most about is Judaism, and and of course, um, Jews have have an allegiance to the story the story of Israel as it's laid out, particularly in the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, and there's a general physical stories, but because they're in such a kind of an, an ancient past, I don't think people really would try to, um, you know, there's no way you could possibly try to establish whether they happened or whether they didn't. I mean, there are archaeologists who go and, and sort of dig up Jericho and then sort of offer opinions as to whether the walls fell down or not. <coughs> but um, but it's, an, it's a different kind of history. I mean, it's it's not focused in one event in the same way that Christianity is. So, so in a way, I think Christianity has much, much more um, in terms of historical records than any other religion. But on the other hand, it, it also needs that. It depends on that than any other faith. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, 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 there's several questions on <laughs> the same sort of theme. I'll just pick one of them. You know, what room does this analysis leave for religious belief? Because it seems to be that there's a, I think it's, it's, it's there are questions that are really asking about the jump from the historical record to the religious belief. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I I find this a really interesting thing about um, you know fact and belief. Um, as I said, it, it's only really from the 18th century that people thought things had to be true, historically accurate, for them to be true. Um, I mean, poets have always known that that um, things don't have to be historically accurate to be true. So I think um, I, I think one of the problems of Christianity today is that people have got so hung up on this idea of did it happen? Did Jesus exist? You know, who was Mary Magdalene? Um, what are all? How do we account for all these historical things? And they are interesting. And I, I mean, I would see myself as a historian, and I really you know like to try and find out what we can about um, about all of these um, these characters and events. But in the end, I do think um, that all we have are the gospel texts. And what the gospel texts are trying to do is to instill belief in people. I don't think the, the gospel writers wrote expecting that people were going to start pulling them apart and asking historical questions about them. I think <coughs> the right way to approach the, historic, the, the gospel texts is to read them as story and to, to, to allow the characters to kind of engage with you, to, to think about the characters and the situations they find themselves in and what it says about Jesus, you know, what, what, what is the story telling me, um, rather than always asking, did it happen? Yeah. There's a question here, why were so many women in the Bible called Mary? It's, it's just a, a, a fact that there's a woman called Tally Lan who's done um, a lot of work on um, on, on uh, grave inscriptions um, and she's she, she's put them all together in a huge catalogue, every single inscription to do with a woman that we have from first century Judea and something like a third of women are called Mary. Um, another large group are called Salome, which again is a, a name we know from the New Testament. And the rest of women are, are you know, a variety of other names, Joanna, Susanna, that kind of thing. So clearly Mary was really, really um, popular. It's, all, it's, a, um, it's a kind of a Greek version of Miriam. Miriam or Mariami is the, the Jewish version. And Mariami was um, Herod I's favourite wife. She was a Hasmonean princess. So, so she had sort of more noble Jewish blood through her. So... Um, clearly, because of her prominence, um, I, I think that's probably why so many girls were called Mary. Uh, but but you get the same thing with men too. This group of names that that, that uh, men are called. So Simon, John. Um, these are very very popular names. Many nicknames in the Gospels too. So Mary Magdalene is probably Mary from Magdala. Um, so she's identified according to where she's from. More often women are identified by their husband or their children or their father 
depending on their age but um you know simon is called peter and um it's there's just a, a, a lot of um, nicknames and I think you needed a nickname because otherwise you'd shout Mary and sort of half of the room would turn around. Uh, you're, you're one of the few academics whose work has been covered by the Sun newspaper, I remember. <laughs> I think it was a documentary that you made and the, 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 it was to do with the, the possibility of female disciples. And I forget when that was when that was made as a program. But how have you got on with that line of arguing? It's um, it's not that novel. Um, I mean, we had one or two documentary. We went to some caves and things like that that hadn't been looked at too much. But um, just the general idea that Jesus had female disciples is is pretty well accepted by um, biblical scholars nowadays. Um, there's no there's no big kind of controversy there. I mean, the Gospels kind of make a big deal of the 12 disciples, the 12 male disciples, but 12 tribes of Israel. And so what Jesus is doing, sort of symbolically walking around with 12 men, is saying um, this is a Jewish renewal movement 12 men representing the 12 tribes of Israel and I, I so I think that 12 the 12 ness is important but but then as soon, um, you know after the death of Jesus the 12 just kind of disappear and I'm never seen again you know 12 is not important in um, church history 12 men but it's very clear that Jesus also had female disciples too I mean people like Mary Magdalene and and, and Mark says at the, at the um, crucifixion that there were a group of women who'd followed him from Galilee so suddenly you get this completely different These women have been walking around with Jesus and the 12 um, throughout the whole of his ministry so I don't think it's disputed nowadays that Jesus, as well as the twelve. Yeah, it's interesting that a lot of the monasteries in Bethlehem were were founded by women, not not, not contemporary, and often I think that they were described as rich women, often Roman. What, what was the attraction of yeah. Christianity to rich Roman women? It's it's strange. Um, <laughs> um, in the second century, um, an opponent of Christianity called Celsus said that um, Christianity of you know low life beggars women um, meaning really uneducated people silly people stupid people like women um and he said that probably shows that there's some basis i mean clearly he's being hugely disparaging but um i don't think he could have said that if if women were really um hardly ever seen so so there does seem to have been some kind of attraction of of, of christianity to women um but also, um, Luke makes a big thing of sort of rich women, women benefactors. Um, and I mean, again, that might have been um, something that, that the women were quite interested in. I mean, a, a lot of people in the ancient world seem to have been interested in Judaism and um, sort of went to synagogues, were interested in the idea of the one God and Jewish ethics, but um, sort of stopped short of, um, of joining the, the movement. Whereas with Christianity, perhaps um, some of the same people who are attracted to uh, Judaism may have um, become Christians. And, and there does seem to be this sort of tradition of um, with women benefactors. I mean, stretching up right up until um, Constantine's mother, of course, who went on her trips around the Holy Land looking for um, bits of the true cross and the founding monasteries and things there. Yeah, the... Um, the uh... We're running out of questions a bit. You seem to be sceptical about the events at Masada, but doesn't the Roman ramp still extant there prove that there was a siege and that the Jews may well have committed suicide? Yes, yes, I mean, absolutely. It, something happened there. And um, I mean, it, and it is an amazing sight if anybody's been there. And, um, you know, the, 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 the typical thing is to go up um, before sunrise and to watch the sun, sunrise coming up there. And from the air, you can see exactly where the Roman camps were. Um, the, the, the reasons why um, scholars generally are, are skeptical about it is that um, as far as we can 
could tell there was no sign of um of zealots or um you know, fighters there the people to have been refugees um and so um that's that doesn't mean that in josephus has it but um but the um most scholars and, and and this is something that i haven't looked at particularly myself but um just from uh, what other people have said is that um, the, the evidence there on the ground doesn't seem to, to support um, to support this this reading. Yeah. Uh, but again, I mean, I think it it, it's, it doesn't matter. I mean, the point is the story is such a powerful one um, that it's um, you know particularly in Israeli culture and it's um, for a long time the Israeli special forces um, were sworn in at, at Masada and um, you know it's got such a powerful cultural um, meaning to it. Yeah. What uh, provenance would you put on the crown of thorns in Notre Dame Cathedral which were uh, there's, a, there's a fascinating BBC documentary just a couple of weeks ago about the fire and the reconstruction but one of the main stories was was rescuing the crown of thorns, the nail from the cross, and I think there was something else in the safe. Uh, I suppose it's a general relic question, isn't it? Are there any, are there any well, I, I guess the answer is that there aren't well verified relics, despite their ubiquity. Uh, no, and, and I, I, I'll have to look for that documentary actually, because I, I, I like a good relic. Um, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think all of these relics, um, you know, they start to appear, I mean, they start to appear relatively early, um, but obviously in the medieval period, that's when they're really going. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's very easy for us to be quite scathing of them. And, and again, I think we've got this hang up about, was it the real hang th crown of thorns? And if it wasn't the real crown of thorns, then we're just not interested in it. Um, and again, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Um, the point is that that this this thing, whatever it is, um, is creates a kind of a space for people to think about what it meant um, for Jesus to be wearing this crown of thorns. What what sort of torture was involved in that? And it's it, it's a moment to be able to reflect on that. I mean, I don't I don't for one minute think that that is the real crown of thorns. I doubt that anybody in the Praetorium or any of the um, people um, later on um, kept the, the the crown of thorns, but um, but again, it's it's what it signifies. I think that's mm. important. There's a great sequence in this documentary where a fireman comes out of the blaze carrying the crown of thorns in his arms, only to be told by the archivist it's the wrong crown of thorns. The real ones are in a safe, <laughs> and then they then they go hunting for the safe. <laughs> and uh, they forget the combination key for the safe. So it's, it's like a, a thriller, oh. well worth uh, watching, uh, very poignant. I, I have to say that, that that was my first, I heard that, the, uh, that Notre Dame was on fire. I mean, after I'd heard that there weren't any people killed, my first reaction was, did they get the crown of thorns? Because I mean, although I don't think it is, it's still, I think, a really holy relic. And I, I do think, there is something, you know. I think it, Protestant churches kind of missed something by not um, by not having relics, by not having pictures, by not having um, things that sort of help you to to think about these stories and the people involved in them. Yes, I think um, we've been Q and Aing for half an hour, and although it's ten minutes before nine, I think we can. Uh, uh, let you off the hot seat now, Helen, and thank you very much for being up for that rapid fire uh, series of, 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 of questions.